Good evening, guests, friends, and fellow fellows. Welcome to this um, Australia Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, WA and South Australia Northern Territory, Territory Divisions uh, joint seminar events uh, this evening. The event is held in person in Perth on a beautiful UWA campus, new building called Yizhong, and also streamed online. So we have people from uh, Eastern States uh, joining this evening's events um, online on Zoom. I'd like to uh, begin with um, acknowledgement of the country. Um, acknowledge the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today. The Ujak people, I think they are part of uh, the Nunga, broader Nunga community uh, in south uh, west of uh, Western Australia. As the traditional owners and custodians of the land, I pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to any Aboriginal and a Torres Island, Torres uh, Strait Islanders people who join us here today. As we share and discover our own knowledge and practice, we acknowledge the deep knowledge uh, forever embedded in the custodianship of the country. Uh, for tonight's events, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Science Teachers Association of WA. I think there are representatives in the uh, audience uh, in the room, and there are a number joining us um, online as well. Um, there are a number of, as I mentioned earlier, a number of um, fellow fellows and other uh, friends and guests joining us around the nation online this evening um, for their support and contribution, participation. I thank them. I also like to thank my committee uh, members, uh, in particular, uh, Professor Simon Bix for actually suggesting this uh, uh, evening uh, uh, this talk for uh, by uh, Peter Queen uh, for this evening at a, one of our previous committee meetings. And of course, uh, Graham Robson and Hong Hao uh, have worked very hard with me over the last uh, six weeks or so to bring uh, this event uh, on board. I also like to thank uh, Dr. Wenshu Chen from Curtin University and Yiling Chen uh, my executive assistant uh, from here, Center for Energy at UWA, for doing uh, so much background work to uh, help us uh, to uh, bring these events together. Um, I'd like to uh, also uh, thank uh, my counterpart, um, the division chair for South Australia and Northern Territory Division uh, Professor Graham Dandy. Uh, this event actually is a joint initiative between uh, WA and South Australia um, uh, divisions to enhance uh, the profile and impact of relatively smaller divisions of the academy. Um, Graham, are you online? Uh, could I ask you to, uh, to do your opening remarks? Okay, well, it's my pleasure to welcome ATSI fellows and guests joining the seminar via Zoom this evening. And in doing so, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains, the Ghana people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As Donke mentioned, this is really the first in a series of joint activities that will be organised by the Western Australian and South Australian Northern Territory Division of the Academy of ATSI. And as two of the smaller divisions of ATSI, we plan to collaborate in a number of ways that will hopefully provide a wider range of activities for our fellows. Starting in August, we plan to run a series of webinars for emerging leaders on current 
topics of interest. And these webinars will feature speakers from both Western Australia uh, and South Australia, and possibly also the Northern Territory. We'll be inviting senior high school students in STEM courses to attend, as well as science teachers to attend these webinars. Our first webinar will be on space research and the emerging space industry in Australia. And this should be of particular interest to all ATSI fellows from all states and territories, as well as senior students and their teachers. So once again, I welcome you all and uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy what would be what will be a very interesting presentation this evening. We look forward to the presentation by Peter Quinn. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Tonight's uh, program um, will um, uh, begin with um, Peter's presentation, um, uh, followed by uh, question and answers. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our fellow fellows, Professor Peter Quinn, Executive Director of International Center for Radio Astronomy Research, or ICRA. Peter graduated from ANU with his PhD in astronomy in 1982. During his appointments at Caltech and the NASA Space Telescope Science Institute, Peter pursued his research interests in galaxy information and dynamics, computational cosmology, and dark matter. Interesting. In 1989, he led the Australia involvement in the macro dark matter search project, whose discoveries were featured on the front cover of Nature 1993. In 1995, Peter accepted a position as division head at the European Southern Observatory headquarters in Munich. While at a ESO, Peter led the efforts to set up a science operations and data systems for the world's largest optical observatory in Cerro Panaro, Chile. In August 2006, Peter became professor of astronomy and uh, astrophysics at the UWA and was appointed inaugural director of the new International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. In 2009, Peter is deputy, sorry, the, the center was established in 2009. Peter is deputy chair of the Australia and the New Zealand SKA Square Kilometer Array Cooperation Committee. He has published over 300 research articles, become WA Scientist of the Year in 2012. He was made a, a fellow, fellow of uh, our academy. Australia Academy of Te Technological Sciences and Engineering in 2013. I remember that I very well because I was on the selection committee. So without further ado, Peter. Thank you very much. Good evening, I'm going to start with a the discovery process, which is going to be what we know in the universe, and how we discover it, and how we can quest the new discovery to provide a translation for astronomy and also for travel. So, the three types of learning are simply how we can discover it, what we know, what we don't know, and the other part of it. So, understanding. Um, so, what do we understand about the physical universe and the this understanding has changed an enormous amount over the last 200 to 300 years. So there was a very fundamental change in understanding that began basically in the late 18th and early 19th century, in particular with Isaac Newton. We went from kind of not being able to predict them when the sun came up or when the moon went down, to being able to predict pretty much to seven decimal places what the universe around us is going to do. So this was made possible by Newton, by his work on gravity. He had a very simple formula, there's not going to be much maths. That I can show you. But um, this one is important because 
describes the gravitational force between the Newton objects in the universe goes like the mass of objects close together, the moment of the distance squared. With that simple formula, you can discover and basically understand much about the planetary systems and other systems in the universe that we see. So this is our planetary system. The planets go around in orbits of various shapes and sizes of various weights. All of the all of the mechanics you see there is contained in that one simple equation. Now the seven decimal places. So it's an incredibly persuasive and uh, fundamental theory of basically our own solar nebula. And with it, you can predict eclipses and you can also predict the mechanics. So this was the first real mathematical description of the universe. It had some assumptions in it about the universe. So Newton's assumptions were that the universe was like a stage, it was flat, it was infinite, it was along all directions without bounds. And furthermore, signals like gravity moved at infinite speed, no matter whether you were close to it. Uh, <coughs> the gravitational force always was instantaneously felt by everybody. So very much like uh, West Australia, flat and infinite in various directions. <laughs> uh, but, but again, this was the assumption, this was the underlying mindset. It's important to remember this. So the universe was predictable with the theory of uh, gravity, you could predict whether the sun was going to come up and down. Um, it was infinite, it was flat, and there were no speed. This idea of the universe being infinite, flat, smooth, went on into the following century, into the 19th century. And these two people in particular applied some of the ideas that I guess Newton really put down. So one was this idea that you can understand planetary systems with a simple law. So Rutherford said we can probably understand atoms by the same kinds of laws, except in this case, the kind of gravity that's important. It's electromagnetism which holds electrons and protons together. So with the same kind of idea, very simple laws you can predict all the mechanics, if you like, of the matter. Similarly, Maxwell said, well, the universe is also smooth and infinite, and the waves of uh, radiation can propagate across the smooth surface. So these two gentlemen sort of extended, if you like, this concept that the universe is infinite, it's flat, it's smooth, and predictable by a fairly simple set of equations uh, down to infinite precision. But towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, some Changes started creeping the people's impressions. This, this is Newton. He was famous with an experiment with light. He shone light through a prism, showed it consists of colors, but the colors were the fundamental building blocks of white light. And it looked like a smooth spectrum of light. So it's the smooth universe idea. If you go and look at this a little bit more closely, more resolution, you see that the spectrum of light the sun is anything but smooth. It has lots and lots and lots of little black lines in it, which say there are places where there's no energy and other places where there is energy. So all of a sudden, the universe, at least in particular with respect to light, is no longer smooth. It's actually quite a discrete sort of process. So where did this discrete behavior come from? It's not contained in Maxwell or Rutherford or uh, to some extent in some ideas at all. It's something that's new. So at the beginning of the 20th century, that was a real revolution. These concepts we had of the smooth, infinite, predictable, uh, no speed limits kind of universe started to change. The very first change was the one that came about by Planck and by Schrodinger. That energy was not smooth, it was in clumps called quantics, there were packets of energy of a particular size and a particular frequency. And energy only came in these packets. There was no smooth, continuous distribution of energy or wavelengths. So, this idea of a quantum of energy or a packet of energy was underlying this whole idea of how an atom works. So, an atom all of a sudden wasn't a smooth planetary system at all. It was basically discrete orbitals, discrete structures, and the movement of energy, movement of particles between these gives these black lines, which are still on the spectrum. So this idea changed our concept of the universe. Fundamentally, that energy was not a single point at all. The consequences of this are far reaching. So one of the other things that um, Newton said was it's predictable. You understand you know, G times M squared over R squared, you can predict anything you want. It's not true anymore. Once you accept the idea that energy only comes in bundles of a particular size, if you shine one of those bundles on an atom to look at it, to get a reflection and look at the atom, that bundle of energy can actually change the atom in a fundamental way. So the very act of observing something by shining light on it changes the behavior of the thing you're looking at. So predictability all of a sudden goes out the door. You cannot, with infinite precision anymore, predict the behavior of things like atoms because the tool that you have to dissect the atom has got quantization, it's got discrete size. You can't get infinitely sharp arrays or scalpel to look inside the atom. So looking at atoms changes everything. 
The other fundamental thing towards, again, the middle of the last century was, of course, Einstein's work. So he removed the rest of the, of the basic tenets of the Newtonian universe, that space is not flat anymore. Space is curved. Matter and energy work together to curve space-time. And there is a limit. It's called the speed of light. So there are speed limits. The universe is not flat. It's not predictable. And it's not smooth. So all of that sort of construct of the Newtonian universe went out the window. That's what a scientific revolution is all about. It all happened in basically the first 20 to 30 years of the 20th century. It changed our understanding. So no longer were we having just to predict when eclipses are going to occur, we can now understand much more interesting things like how atoms work, how molecules work, how DNA in particular works, and how the mechanics of DNA works, how you make new proteins by folding drugs together, the fact that there's an expanding universe, that the universe of the is like a static object. It was a direct prediction of the work of Einstein. Um, general relativity, which Einstein also contributed, non smooth universe or non flat universe, is needed to basically make GPS work. The GPS satellites need corrections inside of there, which came from the formulas of Einstein to make GPS work. So, all of these things came about from the fundamental changes in our understanding that came from Einstein after the Newtonian interpretation. So this is Mr. Hubble, he was one of the guys that was very important in the story. He discovered that the universe was expanding, so the further away a galaxy or a star appeared to be, the higher the velocity it had, so it's like some sort of expanding bubble of stuff. The other important thing was extreme astronomy. This is a really recent and relevant kind of discovery just a few years ago, that black holes and big massive objects that circle each other can emit also a particular kind of gravitational radiation. This was a theoretical prediction of what it looks like, and in fact, it was observed. So, again, an infinitely fantastic success, if you like, of this new interpretation of the universe in terms of general to non flat space time. So, we're, we're, we're doing great. We've got a fantastic theory of atoms, we've got a fantastic theory of the universe and gravity. What more could we ask? Well, we're in the same position Newton thought it was in, more or less at the end of the 17th and the 18th century. So what picture, what, what's the cartoon picture now that presents us, is presented to us by this cartoon picture of the universe? So this is a cartoon. As I said, the universe began with some sort of initial event. It expanded from that event called the Big Bang. So time goes to the right in this particular hourglass or wine glass kind of picture. And as time went by, the universe was a very hot, rapidly expanding system. As it expanded, like all hot, hot rapidly expanding systems, it cooled and things began to condense out. And we condense them across, in this case, it's the stars and galaxies we see around us today. So we're over here on the right hand side of this hour of this wine glass, looking back into it and seeing all the stars and galaxies around us. There was a particularly interesting point in this story around here. It's called basically where the universe was cool enough for the very first time to have stars and galaxies form. That's kind of what we call the first light or the dawn of creation, whatever you want to call it. The universe was cool enough here to basically start making objects. And then those objects have cascaded and avalanched together and formed larger and larger objects as time has gone So, this is the Big Bang expansion. It's 13.7 billion years of cosmic history. And a few hundred million years after the beginning is when that was actually going to occur. So, this is the picture that Einstein and, um, and uh, Planck and, and Schrödinger have given us. So, this is really the edge. We saw the edge of the observable universe. It would be kind of nice to be able to see that at some point because if we could see that, and maybe we can see some of the interesting things as well. But things started to go wrong with this picture. Again, just like things started to go wrong with the Newtonian picture, things began to go wrong with this picture of Einstein and Planck. In particular, one interesting thing is what happens at this time of the Big Bang as we go back in the history of the universe to this Big Bang point, the distance, of course, goes to zero, and having zero on the bottom line many equation is not a good thing, as we all know. So there's something wrong here. We missed something in this description of gravity, at least at a very small distances. It doesn't get infinitely big. It's absolutely wrong. Similarly, if we have this idea of, of, a, of a photon of light, which is the smallest chunk of energy we can have, the universe doesn't really squish itself down so small it goes to the small photon. Itself. So we don't seem to have a good description of what the universe, what happened to the universe when it began. At the very beginning of the universe, there was gravity, there was quantum, there was physics, there were atoms and, and molecules, etc. So, what describes that from the beginning in the detail? So, 
just like we discovered the lines in the spectrum. We need to make some more discoveries to help us fill in the blanks. We've obviously missed something in the story because we can't describe two successful ideas which work for GPS satellites and DNA and all sorts of things. Don't seem to work in the early years. So we need to go out and find some new stuff to tell us to fill in the gaps. So discovery in astronomy is, is an interesting process. It's all about finding edges or pushing through edges and looking out for something beyond the edge of what we currently know and seeing new things. Uh, there are not these kinds of things out there, I can assure you. Um, West Australia is a particularly relevant place because people have been finding the edge here for a long time. On this edge here, people crashed into it uh, routinely uh, in the 1640s and 1600s in general. So, you know, it's, it's finding that edge for astronomy. So how do we do that? Um, we map the sky, obviously. We don't have to know what's out there, what's, what we've found, what we haven't found. People have been making maps of the sky for a long, long time. These go back hundreds and hundreds of years to the Chinese, I suppose, even to the indigenous people in Australia that maps of the sky. Speaking of indigenous people in Australia, this is a modern map of the sky. This is the Milky Way. So we're incredibly lucky here in Australia. If you go outside, pull down on the ground for various reasons, look straight up. Um, you can see the Milky Way is split across the zenith, across our sky. It's a beautiful part of, of the world, a beautiful scene, basically, in the world. And many places in the world can't see this anymore because of light pollution and things like that. So we're very lucky in Western Australia to be able to do it. Um, so this is the Milky Way. You can see there's lots of this milkiness, which is the Milky Way. There's many, many millions of stars that we can't see. These are made many galaxies and lots of clouds. To us, and there's this black stuff here as well, which is actually dust in the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of the star formation process, the creation of dust. One of the things the Aboriginal people actually did as some of the very first astronomers was to actually connect, not make constellations from connecting stars like the Chinese and the Greeks and that sort of thing, but make constellations from connect, connecting the black stuff together. So one of the connections they made was this. So that's the big emu. It's extremely large, as you can see, it takes off most of the sky. But they made that picture from the black stuff because being in Australia and having no lights and inscription anywhere around them, they can see this blackness just as well as they can see the black. So the Milky Way, that's a modern picture of the universe. It's, a, it's, it's glorious and it's, it's, it's historic, but is that we want to go beyond the Milky Way to find more stuff. So how do we step out of the Milky Way? How do we find more things in the universe? We have to, of course, be able to measure distances. And measuring distances in astronomy, you know, I have to emphasize to the physicists and the engineers that we can't go out with a tape to measure and measure things. We all we've got is a point of light in the sky, and you have to tell you how far away it is. And that's a challenge. Okay? So there's a couple of different ways of doing that. One is to use a thing called the standard candle. So if you've got something that you know the brightness of, the further you move it away, you measure its apparent brightness. And by the ratio of the brightness here and the brightness down there, and then it goes like, goes like one over R squared, we can measure the distance. Similarly, a ruler, if you know how long it is, and you push it away, you measure the apparent size and the real size, it goes like one over R as well. So if you've got standard rules and standard candles somewhere in the universe, then maybe we could use these to measure the distance. Another particularly interesting way of measuring distance, which is probably the most common way of measuring distance in astronomy, particularly for galaxies, is the Doppler effect. So you know the Doppler effect, if you dip your finger in the pond, you make beautiful waves. If you dip your finger in the pond and you basically have that finger move across the pond, then of course an interesting thing happens in the direction of motion gets squished and the other direction it gets expanded. So if we have a galaxy emitting a signal or a light signal that's moving away from us, the frequency of that signal will actually decrease. So here's a galaxy, now the Milky Way, it's another galaxy. The galaxy is actually full of gas, hydrogen gas. This is a picture of a hydrogen gas that lives inside the galaxy. The hydrogen gas is a million block of stars. The hydrogen gas emits a particular radio frequency, about 21 centimeters wavelength. That's the hydrogen transition of the black lines, if you like, in the spectrum of hydrogen. And so here it is, 21 centimeter radio frequency, about 1.4. 1.4 gigahertz, so mobile phone kind of frequencies. If that galaxy was moving away from me, it would be different data because the wavelength stretches out and gets longer. So the stretch of that wavelength is another way of measuring the velocity of the recession. So Hubble uses the great effect. So Hubble discovered that indeed the distance of an object and its velocity were related. He could do this by not appealing to the doctor, but by appealing to other things. So he knew that there was a relationship between the distance and velocity. If I can tell you how to measure velocity or the Doppler effect, you can then measure distance. So we have a way of measuring distances in the universe by measuring the velocity. The So here's a picture of the universe, a modern picture of the universe. So we're looking at ways down there in the middle. 
and we're smoothing out of the type of velocity at warp speed away from the Milky Way. Um, and we're seeing these are real galaxies at real positions because we've measured their distance. So we can look, we can form a three-dimensional map. As you go out, it's like random as you'd expect in this galaxy, the galaxies are there. But one of the things we discovered, we discovered as we got better at measuring this of distances, is the universe is not smooth at all. It has some rather amazing structure. At the very last, so every single dot on this picture is a galaxy. As you go further and further out, you see there's these walls and filaments. It's very much like a spider web, lacy kind of uh, structure. Why should the universe look like this? Why isn't it just a random collection of galaxies all over the place? So this was the first indication there was physics we were missing. There was something about the way the seeds of galaxies were laid down, which introduced this beautiful structure. And we only got to this structure by discovery, by discovering how to measure distances to galaxies and by doing that better and better over time. Another way of doing it, we talked about the stand candles. These things are supernova. So if stars, as they come to the end of their life, explode. Turns out that they want to do that, the brightness of that explosion is roughly constant from start to start. Great, we've got a standard candle. So here's an LMC that the neighboring galaxy to us one night. The next night it looked like that. So there was in 1987 an explosion, a supernova explosion in the LMC. You can see it the next time. These become extremely bright and supernova, basically as bright as the whole galaxy that we in. So you can use them as a standard candle to measure your distance, and you can do that to great distances, much greater distances than the simple virtue. <coughs> These three gentlemen here use supernovae in the galaxies to measure galaxy distances to a much greater distance than it than Hubble was able to do. And so here they plug in Mr. Hubble's diagram, that's the <coughs> distance versus velocity. And what they saw was, well, it's not so much a straight line, but it begins to deviate in an interesting way away from the straight line. And that was the very first indication that the universe wasn't uniformly expanding. It was actually accelerating. So as for some bizarre reason, the universe has decided to accelerate at the time. And that's incredibly strange because the only force that we know that's relevant to the universe is gravity. Gravity pulls things down, doesn't push things out. So all of a sudden we've discovered a cosmic push. Something's pushing the universe apart. We have no idea what it is. People call it dark energy. It's an extremely mysterious thing. But it's an example of one of the discoveries that's been made basically with um, the new telescopes, the new techniques, and new technologies. And it's filling in blanks. We didn't know this before. We can measure distances to supernova and distant galaxies. And so this won the Nobel Prize for physics and Well, okay. So we're back to our cosmic uh, cartoon again. It's now lying with us. We're over here on the right hand side. We've made some discoveries, they're really good, but we haven't really addressed the so There's a single dark energy, there's a single dark matter, which we'll talk about later on. There's this constant push, there's this constant structure, you don't know where that's coming from. Okay, that's good. But all those observations are kind of fairly nearby to us in this kind of cosmic picture. So the supernovae that I just showed you are kind of about there on the cosmic timeline. We'd love to know how all of this changed with time. In other words, was this dark energy pushing the thing always there in the cosmic history? Is it a recent phenomenon? Is it not? Where did it start? So we would love to go back to here, to the cosmic dawn on the left-hand side of this diagram, to the very first objects. So that's the beginning of the universe. In other words, as astronomers, we sit here on the Earth, we look out into the universe. The further something away it is, the longer the light takes to reach us. So we have a cosmic kind of time machine situation. The further something is away, the longer the light takes to get us, and the older the star, the further back in time you see it. It's like digging down on the Earth, you, know, you dig down a few meters and you get bones wrappers, you dig down a few hundred meters and you get dinosaurs. But as you get out of the Earth, and you go back into the, into the history of the Earth. Similarly, as you go into the universe, you dig out into the universe, you go back in cosmic time. So we, in principle, can go back in cosmic time to this first point, provided we can see things which are very far away. So it's very far away things that are indeed the very, very oldest. So we're over here on the right-hand side, we've got eyeballs. Eyeballs are not a terribly good collecting device. We're about 10 to the minus five square meters of, of collecting area. We can do better. We can build the dish, the famous cell dish in parks. That's about a thousand square meters of collecting area, much better eyeballs. And that does a really good job of looking at this sort of nearby stuff. We can just add more of those together and make a bigger collecting area. So then some of the biggest in the world are about 10,000 square meters. That's great. That gets us to about distance one on this ladder. We want to get to distance 10. That's where this cosmic edge is. 
Um, so, so we would love to get to this distance 10, which is kind of the point where we would see this edge. We would see the very first objects. And in principle, if we see the first objects, we see in chapter one of the storybook, and that basically produces a little bit. So, of course, even for distance one and distance 10, how much of your telescope do you need? Unfortunately, it's not a factor of 10, it's a factor of 100 because it goes up and down. So, we need to build something which is 100 times bigger than this 10,000. 10,000 times 100 happens to be a million, which is a square kilometer of equilibrium. How is that even feasible? Is that even possible to put a square kilometer of equilibrium? Given at the moment we've got about 10,000 square meters, is about where we are right now. So, this is like uh, the, the, the retort card for astronomy. So, here is um, how much better. Every telescope that's been built is then its predecessor as a function of time, going back to Galileo. So Galileo was better than the eyeball by quite a lot, back in 456. And every time we build a telescope, mostly over the last couple hundred years, it's been better by a factor of four, five, or six, or ten, better than what came say 20 years before. Building something which is a million square meters is about a factor of 3,000 times more capable than anything we carry. So in one one generation of telescope builders, instead of messing around in here, we did that. Okay? So the analogy I like here is that's about the same ratio as the distance from Earth orbit to the Moon. And that's a factor of 3,000. So that was the Apollo project, basically, is kind of what we're trying to do here in terms of the step up in terms of the capabilities of the As you can imagine, that creates opportunities. Right? So the third part of the story is opportunity. The SKA project. Square kilometer array project is a real thing. People have been thinking about it for the last 20 years or more. Um, they basically um, started designing it back in the early part of 2010, 2011. Just a few years ago, March 2019, an intergovernmental organization of countries was put together to find the money to build this square kilometer array thing. So Australia was one of the very first uh, members of that. Here are the countries Australia, Canada, China, France, Germany, Britain, Korea. So this organization is real, it exists, it came into existence for the last year, it's got 15 countries, and those 15 countries are getting together to build this today. And in fact, tomorrow is the council meeting that decides to start construction. So it's a very timely point for this talk, uh, because we could be one celebration tomorrow. So this building uh, in Manchester, we're, it's where the headquarters of the project are, we're looking at new member states, but we've been in this pre-construction st stage for about the last seven or eight years, uh, that's about a couple hundred million years of the design work. The SKA construction project, which will go from next year, this year, through to about the end of the decade, is about a two billion euro construction project. And as I said, tomorrow is a very important decision. So it's a very large. The SKA, the Square Corner Ray, will have two, basically two parts, two locations. The location of what's called the SKA Low Telescope is basically going to be in Western Australia, in Murchison Shire in Western Australia. It's a, a low frequency telescope. It receives low frequency radio waves, the kind of radio waves that FM radio stations work. So between 50 and 350 megahertz. It consists of basically things that look like Christmas trees. They're basically dipoles that receive this low frequency signal. So we're going to build about 130,000 of those dipoles across the Western Australian desert, uh, spread out over an area of about 100 kilometers. By 100 miles. So it's a very large engineering project in the Irish Australian centers. The other part of the telescope is in South Africa, in the Cape province, in uh, the western part of South Africa. Here they're building dishes, so dishes that move. The Christmas trees don't move, they're just stay static. These, about 200 of these dishes, which are at higher frequency, about 10 times higher frequency than the low frequency ones. The reason for this split in frequencies is the signals that come from the very early universe, from the edge of the Universe come at this low frequency domain. So, this SKA telescope in Australia would be the telescope to discover the edge, which is very exciting. The one in South Africa is a great survey telescope. It looks at objects in fine detail across the universe. So, we're very lucky in Western Australia. We have lots of great things um, the world's best wine, um, some large holes, um, and some great beaches. But the thing we have a lot of, which is probably the more valuable thing, is, is that um, we have isolation. So the one thing that's important for astronomy, particularly radio astronomy, is to be way, way away. As I told you, the signals from the edge of the universe come in at the FM frequency. So like a little tiny piece of every FM station you listen to has a signal from uh, redshift a thousand. So it's all there. 
So to listen to that incredibly faint signal, you want to be way, way away from any interference that can radio stations, TVs, etc. So isolation of the West Australian desert is, is precious for this kind of science. Just to give you some idea, this is a spectrum, so I don't get the details, but basically frequency is along the bottom line, and signal strength is up here. And this goes from basically the mobile phone frequencies all the way through to the middle of that 700 megahertz. You can see it's dead flat, there is nothing there. Right? So if I did that experiment in the city, it would be spikes on it. So the only thing of any interest here is that signal there, which happens to be a galaxy up the end. So this pristine window into the universe is what this Australia provides for the SKA project. Lots of happening in Western Australia to get ready for this project. So I came here in 2006. Since about 2007, lots of things have happened. There was basically about $500 million spent the year before they decided where to build the telescope. So there was a new institute called Icaro Curie. There was an observatory Curie with some precursor telescopes, like Okada. Energy systems, spider optic cables, supercomputer centers. All this happened in advance of even the first telescope. So it's about $500 million of investment, most of the Commonwealth. There was another $300 million announced in 2015 as Australia's contribution to start the construction project. Just a few weeks ago, back in April, um, there was $387 million more because the telescope was the first time to build it. One of the was a $600 million, $600 million euro telescope. Now it's a $2 billion euro telescope. So 40% of $2 billion is much more than 40% of $600 million. So there's more money being put on the table, which was announced just recently. And what's going to happen? About half a billion dollars worth of infrastructure is going to appear in West Australia, paid for one project, several hundred construction jobs, several hundred long term operations jobs, and about $65 million in just an operations cost. So, this is again mining project class investment. Give you some idea of what the actual site looks like. So, this mural home, I'm going to zoom in onto, onto the Murchison Shire in Western Australia, uh, and I'll show you what's basically happened there over this 10 year period. So we basically created the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, it's where we're testing a lot of the ideas for the telescopes. So you can see it's a big flat red place. Um, there are 36 of these little dishes out there, they're 12 little dishes. This is called the Australian SKA Pathfinder. So it's testing out some of the technologies from the SKA. This exists, it's a scientific instrument, it's doing science really, and it's testing out how to deal with data at 1% Today, but how to deal with this kind of data So, we've built this, it's working suicide so around there. A piece of innovation from Australia is those receivers. So, those receivers on these dishes are like a digital radio camera. So, it's like a digital optical camera, digital radio camera. So, you can see lots of pixels of radio sitting on the sky. There's another telescope out there called the Murchison Wide Field Array. It's like the precursor of the Christmas trees, and the static, spider like things. Low frequency receivers. Again, this is an operational telescope. We have about 4,000 of those spiders out there in the desert right now, receiving signals from the universe and the science. Of course, you need computers to collect the signals. This is the operations building at the current Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. It needs to be inside an RF locked environment. There's 120 dB from engineers of protection between the inside and outside because computers generate radio noise. They would interview with telescopes, the sensor. So we have to hide inside buildings. We've got no power on the site, so we can make our power sensors. This is one of the largest solid battery systems in Australia, about two and a half and four hours of battery. This is all, all this infrastructure has gone in to develop the site in Western Australia as a precursor site, only a 1% realization of the telescope. The center of the full telescope is about 30 kilometers, will be about 30 kilometers away. We've started to prototype some of the actual receivers from the SKA. So this is the prototypes of the Christmas trees. They're already out there, and we're testing them out. In fact, this first design is a fairly simplified uh, Hill's Hoist version. We decided it needs a bit of tweaking, so you'll see a much more advanced version. Um, one of the things we try to do is keep people away from the site, keep everybody away from the site, because it's obviously people have their cell phones and things like that. That's why I have not of visitors. It's something we try to avoid. This visitor shows up all the time. <laughs> and he, um, he, he makes a point of checking out every single innovation we're actually putting in. But uh, he's fairly friendly, most of them. So here are the new generation uh, Christmas trees. So these are basically the upgraded version. These have a much broader bandwidth of reception than the old ones. <laughs> um, and, and basically, it is about one full farm. There's going to be about 500 farms, about 256 of these in the farm. About 500 of those times eventually. This is kind of farm size, you can see it. And so, again, this is the precursor. 
I mentioned that these telescopes are basically doing uh, science. So basically they're generating uh, scientific results. So this is the MWA, one of the tiles. This is a whole map of the Milky Way. So you saw the Milky Way before the beginning here. In the radio frequency, you don't see the big leaving anymore. You're looking through that dust and seeing emissions in the whole Milky Way. The ASCAP, the ASCAP telescopes are also doing science, mapping the hydrogen gas in the mantle of the clouds and nearby galaxy stars. And of course, our friends in South Africa are not sitting around doing nothing. This is the South African precursor telescope, and they're also doing great work making maps of the Milky Way galaxy in the high frequency. So lots of things are happening. ICRA, the International Center, is now about 10 years old, 12 years old. We are being funded by the West Australian government and two universities, UWA and Curtin universities. So we're a joint venture. We've got about 200 staff and students. We work a lot with industry. We produce a large amount of about 2,000 publications. But one thing I want to emphasize is this demographic shift. So when I came to Western Australia in 2006, there was about two astronomers in the West Coast. Now that is clearly the entire community of Australia astronomers in the West Coast. So there's been a fairly good shift. ICRA was created by the West Australian government to anchor the project in Western Australia. If we didn't have something to anchor this project, we would go all to the East Coast to be So anchoring this project here gives returns to Western Australia, diversifies the Western Australia economy, brings Visitors, brings the students, brings the staff, brings the innovations to West Australia. And that's been part, that's the real reason why it was created, is to hold and nurture and grow the strength of West Australia. So we do lots of science. We also work with the SKA in terms of this actual building it. So these are all the work packages, all the things that you have to do, infrastructure, dishes, Christmas trees, all the work that you have to do to build with SKA. ICRA is working particularly with the SKA on sending signals around the array, the data processing in the array, and building these uh, Christmas trees. So those are things that are specifically happening as part of the array and part of ICRA's work. The big advantage we've had is we're here in Western Australia. We're here on the ground. We can go to the site. Most of the other countries, most of the members of the SA project are not here. They can't go to the site, so we can. So that's been, we can build up the skill set. We can actually go out there and do things, train people, do things with people on site. And basically succeed with those national colleagues and getting results. But it's that locality which has been the incredible strength of how the equipment in Western Australia. Also, there are other things other than the site, supercomputer centers. We have the Pawsey Supercomputer Center in Perth. It's going to be one of the major hubs of the data flow from the SKA. And of course, we can also have people work with the Pawsey Center, gain experience with the Pawsey Center, and use that to actually grow the SKA capability. <laughs> I want to talk about three particular things that happened because of ICRA existing, but not to do with the SKA, but to look at the technology that we basically have in the SKA and how it's applied elsewhere. Space situation awareness, laser communications, and big data. These are three things that are happening <coughs> now, which are a consequence of what skill sets we develop. So let's talk about space situation awareness. Most cities in the world have FM radio stations. The FM radio stations have towers like this. They send signals in all directions. In particular, the signals go up to the sky. When the FM signals go up into the sky, they can, of course, bounce off anything that's metal and it shines back down. So if you've got a piece of space junk in, in the sky, the FM signal re reflected, this is passive radar technology, comes back across your own nice little radio telescope that can actually detect it and you can see it. So these things are not only good looking at the edge of the universe, they're also good looking at space junk. And so we've got a whole project uh, basically cloning this entire system for a space junk tracking company. Basically, so this is again another example. This is a piece of, this is actual real observation of space junk. And we can get down to the one meters of class. The other thing which is really interesting is the laser communication technology. We had a contract to basically send, send signals to send signals from the central computer system we saw to all the dishes in the, in the SKA mid telescope. So when you send signals along lots and lots and lots of fiber optic, tens of kilometers across that fiber optic twists and bends and change of shape, you lose phase, you lose coherence. And so we invented a system to basically maintain that coherence of the signals along the fiber optic cable. Fantastic, it works. We've got a contract to bring this for the SKA mid telescope in South Africa. The same technology applies to sending laser beams through the sky. So if you send a laser beam from the Earth to orbit, the laser has to go through a turbulent atmosphere. You need to correct that signal. That same corrective methodology that we developed for the today works extremely well for sending laser signals to satellites and lower orbit. 
And so if you want HD television for the moon, you have to be able to send high bandwidth signals. Um, and so we have now started our project of basically an optical ground station network of sending laser beams basically out of telescopes, optical telescopes this time, to basically to, to lower for the satellites and then correct those signals and power definition television. Data, big data is probably the big challenge for the SKA. These are some telescopes in the world, the Hellman LSST. They're forefront telescopes to give you some idea. They generate petabytes of data a year. Petabytes is a million gigabytes of data. So it's like petabyte. But per people standards, the NASA deep space, the NASA Earth Resources Network is about four petabytes as well. So a few petabytes is a hell of a lot of data. The SKA generates 400 petabytes of data, 700 petabytes of data. So this is like two orders of magnitude larger data challenge than we've ever had to face in the physical science before. So how are we going to deal with this kind of a challenge? We know we're going to need the world's largest computers to do this. So we have collaborations with some of the world's largest computer systems. Our friends in Oak Ridge in the US run the Summit computer, which is part of the world's largest machine, 200,000 cores, 200 petaflops. Um, its energy bill is 24 million euros per annum, just to run with power. So it's a big machine, right? Um, and it's, we have, because we're collaborating with some of this data technology, we have access to this machine to try it out. So we ran a whole simulation of the SKA from the, from the Christmas trees all the way down through the detection. We actually mimic detecting the signal from these environments. It took us six hours, three hours of computer time to get six hours of telescope time. Right? So in other words, this, this the world's largest machine just managed to do this. Right? So we don't have the world's largest machines yet in the SKA. That's part of the This was a Gordon Bell final in that's all good, but this is all happening on a global scale. It's not just happening in Australia, it's also happening in like 15 countries around the world. We're doing this, so we have to figure out how to get from this flood of data, which is overflowing everything we can put in this way, and get that into the hands of astronomers. How do you, how do you manage this complicated sort of network of resources around the world? We end up getting science done. It's a real change in the methodological way science is done. Uh, normally, you know, if you're an astronomer, you go to a telescope and take, collect some data on the table, bring it home, you sit it on the laptop, and you analyze it. These days, with the SKA, that's not possible. What you need in the middle here, the machinery you need to analyze your work and deal with the data, is a whole network of supercomputers distributed around the world. So that's a really complicated mess of stuff. Astronomers are not good at that sort of stuff. Nobody is good except <laughs> very highly qualified computer scientists. So we need to figure out how to make this accessible for basically. Astronomers and computer side to this area. The SDA has been built, it's, we know that much. Um, it's been paid for by this international project. But this computing system, this stuff down here, the community of users around the world have been given the job to this together. So we want to basically create a system of regional centers around the world to do the SDA computing job. How are you going to do that? This could be a network of computer systems, each one of them world leading biggest computer world kind of stuff. Some in Perth, some in South Africa, some in Canada, some in Europe. So there's an international effort going on right now to make a partnership to build this network of data centers to solve this really complicated data management problem. That's just not, it's not only a starting problem. Anybody who's doing XSL data, like the resources industry, want to do things like this as well. So the relevance of what we're doing is broad in terms of small data centers. And we just recently got $63 million to do this. So that was part of our budget operations. So Australia is highly invested in doing this. We will have one of the leading regional centers in the world based here. Okay, so one of my childhood heroes um, talked about walking on the edge. This guy said walking on the edge. Um, that Apollo analogy is actually quite a good one. We are trying to go up by a factor of 1,000, 3,000 generation. You can see the edge we're looking for, it's pretty far out there. And you need to build a machine which is particularly special to get there. But along the way, we have a long way to this discovery, Marcia. Along the way to this discovery, lots of interesting things were found. There are lots of interesting technologies to discover. I hope that I've just shown you, like, particularly isolated technology. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure they are 
lots of uh, uh, questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, welcome questions uh, from the audience. Eric, sorry, Jim. Oh. The scale of this is just loads your brain. And we all know from the lighting industry that big projects take an enormous amount of project management and um, planning. When we've got, you know, 15 countries involved as well, how is that actually going to work out? So one of the things that we've had to do is to build an organisation and build a project at the same time. So over the last 10 years, we've been building an SKA organization, headquarters in Manchester in the UK. But in that headquarters now, we have 250 people already that cover these skill sets, the systems engineering, the mechanical and electrical engineering, the procurement, the legal, the admin, the HR, all of that sort of uh, skill set you need to amass to do a project this scale has been assembled effectively in Manchester over the course of the last 10 years. And they are the central authority. So what they say basically goes, Australia and South Africa are the two host countries. We are implementing the plan, the basic the plan, the planning authority of the city manager to the organization. Jen. What determines the position of the, the dishes? Uh, they just going to be scattered around the room. So I'll just to repeat the question for the online audience. Uh, Jen has asked um, uh, the positioning of the dishes Yes. Yeah. So the, the kinds of telescopes that they build, um, the bigger the sort of the Christmas trees, because they, all they do is connect the numbers from the sky. You have to combine those numbers in uh, some kind of way to make an image, you know, sort of images you saw, regular images or something. So the positioning of them basically you can distribute them in an optimal manner to collect the most information about the image. They're not, they're not collecting images, it's not like a Pair of binoculars that we see something with the iPhone. All those telescopes are planted as lots and lots of them. You have to combine the lots and lots in a clever way to make an image. The fidelity of that image is related to the space. So the further apart two antennae are, the higher the resolution of the picture. So you want some of your antennae very far apart. The closer they are together, the more energy they receive at a particular frequency. And so that gives you more signal. So you want this combination of getting lots of signal, lots of things together, but everything, some stuff far apart, different levels. So the ability and signal strength drive where those dishes are, where those are. It's, I mean, imagine a before they transform. Robin. Yeah, I'm Robin. Can you tell us a little bit about telescope lifespan of the four radio telescopes and what you expect the lifespan of the SKA? Uh, Professor Robin Owen's question is about the lifespan of the telescope. So telescopes are notoriously long-lived, sometimes too long, basically. Um, so telescopes are being used for more than 100 years. The SKA has a design lifetime of about 50 years. So that's the infrastructure we're putting in place is expected to last 50 years. We may change the kind of Christmas tree, we may change the kind of dish, but the infrastructure that it connects to, the fiber and power, etc. Is expected to last about 50 years. So that's the kind of most of those telescopes on that timeline I showed you before. The typical turnover time is about 20 years. So every 20 years, you kind of get a new generation of telescopes, but any individual telescope can live much longer. So Dick. I mean, you're very, a very interesting story. I've got two questions. Question number one is uh, you said the origin of the universe and how things moving. Will you be able to predict that our universe will one day be from somewhere in the black hole? That's number one. Number two, are you going to be able to predict when things will come? Is there other universe where there is life? So, um, on the first question, um, the expansion of the universe and the dark energy problem. <clears throat> At the moment, the dark energy problem says there is no the universe, just goes on expanding, 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 basically, forever. That's what the dark energy story tells us as we currently understand. So there's no cycle of the universe, there's no mountain. It's just a forever expanding one big bang, one big model is what the dark energy expresses. In terms of trying to figure out what's out there, I think the biggest, one of the things that telescopes 
had in common is that they're almost always famous for stuff they weren't supposed to do. <laughs> so um, you, you build this telescope to find the edge of the universe. You build it to map the universe. You build it X, Y, Z. It will probably become the most famous for telling you too. Because this, this telescope is a, is a big uh, listening station for uh, radio signals and stuff. Everybody's got radio signals out there. We should have to catch them. So I think the, for me, the excitement is in the things that can be discovered that we have. So ET finding is certainly one of the strengths of this telescope. You might get most of the strongest to admit it because they don't like to talk about it, but it is in fact one of the things that this telescope will Tim. Hey, that was, that was fascinating, but I have what is perhaps a quite naive question. That, how do we know that the light from the very first bit that we're looking for hasn't passed us away? <laughs> Tim's uh, question is um, about the the light passing, well, the first light we see, whether that's been passed us before. So it's it's part of the short form of analogies. Right? So I can make an analogy about the universe and I can expand it and things like that. And it works for some things. The question you're asking is more test the analogy. The way you solve that basically is by saying that the path light takes is determined by the matter of the universe. So if there's the matter of the universe is, it contains us, so we're expanding. The matter of the universe is expanding. Light will follow that path. So light doesn't have any other path to follow other than that path. So it can't go past because there's nothing to go past with. So the matter of the universe is the highway in which the heart light is following. Jen. I have a principle question. Sorry, I'm just when you publish a paper, someone else should be able to repeat the work yeah. uh, and validate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On these huge databases, how can anyone else get access to this information and validate what you're saying? Very good. So, yeah, so I'll repeat the question for the <laughs> Jen asked the question um, science, um, one of the, when you publish um, uh, scientific papers, uh, one of the uh, fundamental requirements is that other people can repeat your work. And um, for um, uh, Peter's um, ICRA work, um, work on huge amount of data, only a few people can access it. How could other people repeat the, the work? Peter. So it opens up an interesting question um, for science in general, but for astronomy in particular. So astronomy in particular has been um, very keen to embrace what's called open sky. So the sky that we have above us is, is no boundaries. So if we have the capability to look at it, Australia should come forward. So we should need to share the resource in some sense. In other words, if we take data that we hear in Australia or in the sky, we put that data into a repository and we make that data available to everybody. Right? So anybody can look at it. And that's a, a concept that astronomy has embraced for a long time. So Hubble Space Telescope, all that incredibly expensive hardware in space and all those beautiful pictures, you can log on all of them. Okay? So there's no doubt you can you can do what you want because it's an open story. So we try our best to basically make the data access. In the end of the day, taxpayers are paid for it. So everybody should be able to use it and do it. Better. So the open sky mindset is something that's going to very much taste the heart. That's the first thing. There's another thing called FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Right? That's FAIR. Um, and that's what we also aspire for. Our so if we have data which we're putting out there for everybody to use, you can easily find it. You can easily do something to it. You can easily run the same method that somebody else would have. So all that, not only do we capture the data, we capture the methods that people have used to generate the data. So you can rerun it if you wanted to. And I know you don't have a, a sun machine in your basement, so the archive, the data collection, is connected to these very large machines. And so we make the machinery and the data available to you. That's the only way that this works. It's fair, but fair principle wouldn't work. Unless people have been able to reproduce, we are compared to reproduce. So that's what we're trying to do as well. It's got practical problems because you know, twenty-five million dollars a year on the power bill, somebody has to pay for that. So finding the people who are willing to pay those bills for everybody to access is complicated sometimes. Sidek. Hey Peter, you mentioned about the space gun, and one of the spin-off. So the private companies, what are they doing with that? So the next question is regarding the space junk. Uh, one of the uh, innovation from uh, Peter's work, uh, Christ's work, is um, a technology to detect 
space junk, uh, which is being used by a private uh, company. Um, so the next question is what the company's so using it for. Our colleagues are working in the MWA issues of this. Um, so we put a curtain in the place where a lot of these technologies come from. Um, the, there is, this is a ground zero. So basically there's, there's a prototype array that companies are assessing. There's no production array. Uh, but we're demonstrating the feasibility of this particular technology. I think we've demonstrated it already. So there's a lot of interest in deploying this kind of system for the space jump track. Space jump tracking is a very big problem. And so any 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 insights is welcome. So yeah, it's it's a good example of the translation of our technologies to this. Any further questions? Yeah, from the back. Yeah, who is the champion in the Western Australian government that supported this project at the beginning? Mm -hmm. And the do you think there's an appetite in the West Australian government today? The question is, um, who is the champion in Western Australia government uh, who, uh, whose effort led to uh, the SKA project in WA? And uh, if there's any appetite in the current government to take this further into the future? Peter. So we've been incredibly lucky in the sense that both at the state and the federal level across 12 years of law, many changes of government orientation of many ministers. The support of this project has stayed strong. Okay? Why is that the case? I think it's because of the sort of thing that I was talking about. This project has the ability to, the federal government has taken a interest in the galaxy of flat holes. They're interested in what this project brings to the state. And that's what's happening now. We're seeing the pe 200 people derived because of it. Right? $500 million worth of infrastructure in the state. These are real things that the state can imagine. That, that's the excitement basically. That's the reason why they're investing. And they've stayed invested across all the chains of government. I've got to pay particular tribute to Alan Carpenter. He was the science minister and premier. He created it for effectively. And, and why he did that was because he saw an opportunity to diversify what the state does. So he was science minister and premier. Alan Burnett was science minister and premier and did the same thing, supported us all the way. So this has happened at the federal level through Kim Carr, uh, so Dennis, all these people with different persuasions, but same vision that being engaged in a large project like this brings enormous benefit across the board. Well, from what I understand, you have an interest in dark matter. Yes. Um, what is your personal uh, goal? What would you like to get out of it to understand dark matter? Wallace's well, question is regarding Peter's interest in dark matter. And uh, specifically, <laughs> what is uh, Peter's uh, aspiration? What so, try to find out about dark matter? Um, so dark matter is an amazing thing. Um, it uh, appears to surround galaxies. So you can see it measure its heat force, its gravitational pull, uh, but we can't see it for some reason. It doesn't shine. So you know, we, the things that do shine, the stars, we can measure how fast they move. And they move too fast. We don't matter they have. And so there's this dark stuff in and around galaxies. And it's very much like the iceberg. It's about 90% of the whole mass of the galaxy is below waves. You don't see it. So it's incredibly embarrassing when you admit, here's all these multi billion dollar telescopes. We have no idea what 90% of the galaxy is. So here it is, it's below waves. So what could it be? Well, it could be dark things. You know, what, what could be dark? Uh, dead stars. Stars stop shine, they black. Okay, great. Rocks. Rocks don't shine. It's all good. So moons and things. It could be something even more interesting, like um, subatomic particles, you know, things that we obviously don't shine, or maybe even little tiny particles. We'll talk about that. So these big things are uh, dead stars and rocks, they're called machos, massive astronomical compact halo objects. Um, <laughs> these little guys are called wimps, so weakly interacting massive particles. And these little guys down here are called wisps, um, which are very, very weak interacting small particles. So this, so all these things are dark, so the attribute is dark, which is fantastic. <clears throat> so one of the things we did was to try to look for some of these things. Just to give you some idea of the range of masses, if the, if the moon was mass one on the scale, then these dead stars are 10 to the moons. These guys are 10 to the minus 49 moons, and these are 10 to the 60, minus 60 moon moons. Right? So huge numbers of decades of mass across the candidate space. 
So we've been looking for these things. With there's various astronomical projects that we look for dark matter, even form of dead stars, moons, some of the dark They've all failed. I was involved in this macho project with these guys. We found machos, but not enough of them to make dark. So yes, you can find them but through various cutting techniques, but you can actually find, look for these things and test their existence. One of the really interesting things, these wisps, um, if that's the Milky Way you saw before, if I take a picture of the Milky Way in the magnetic domain, so this is the magnetic field of the Milky Way, the Van Gogh kind of uh, picture of the, of the Milky Way, those are the magnetic fields. If the dark matter that's running around is the wispy guys, 10 to the minus 64 electron volts or massive moons, if the, as soon as they interact with the magnetic field, they explode and give us some energy. So it turns out. Um, and so if you have a radio telescope and one of these things uh, hits the magnetic field, the radio is a ra very, very, very weak radio signal generally. So if we've got an SKA, we can look for this weak radio signal, which is the first detection of these. Incredibly interesting, but probably the only surviving candidate for dark matter is these things called WISPs. So there are, uh, there are axioms for those that are in the, in the know. And this is actually worked in at UWA. So UWA leaves the charge in looking for axions as dark matter. Uh, it was published a few years ago. So again, another way of using radio telescopes to find dark <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Could I ask a question um, from second law of thermodynamics? Basically, determines you know time is one moving in one yes. direction. What that relates to must be related to the expansion of the universe. I think that's, I think that's true. I think the, the, the common picture we have right now is that this ex the energy was injected into the system at the beginning. And the, that's the beginning, right. Yep. And it expanded, uh, as you know, um, mm -hmm. and things condensed, and all that stuff, but it continues to expand. And as the energy density gets lower and lower, it gets colder and colder and colder. Mm -hmm. And basically, the universe becomes very black and very dark at some point in the future. And that's the end of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of boring, but that's the story we have. Right now. I'd like it to be a bit more interesting than that. And, uh, maybe some of the things we've we'll discovered will tell us. Excellent. Well, uh, I haven't received any questions uh, from online audience. Um, I'd like to um, uh, perhaps uh, draw this uh, presentation to to a close.